Hello and welcome to Mental Health Mondays. We are excited. Um, today we have Miss Cardinelli, Nolly, sorry about that, encouraging change, change using motivational interviewing. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here again. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. I am a student at Align International University. I'm currently completing some training with the Institute on Violence, Abuse, and Trauma. I'm doing a lot of therapy, a lot of training, a lot of evaluations, um, and just really happy to be able to share some information about mental health and ways that you can help others, including yourself, make changes in your life that you might want to see. So I'll go ahead and jump right in. So I'm going to be talking about motivational interviewing today. So Motivational interviewing is actually a style of therapy, um, and it's a way to really collaborate with people to guide them through changes or things that they want to make happen in their life. So even though it is, you know, particularly in research-based therapy approach, the principle of motivational interviewing can really be used for any kind of change behavior that someone wants to see. So if a friend or a family member is either doing things that might be hurting them, usually it's used for substance use, but that could even be them coming to saying, you know, oh, they're overeating and they have high blood pressure or something's happening with their health and their doctor's telling them to take care of it. And they're just kind of talking to you about it. Or maybe someone is really angry with everyone in the family and it's causing a lot of conflicts and you want to try and help make things better if they're willing to listen. Um, it can really be used for all kinds of different strategies. Some of the examples I'll show um, have been used in substance use specifically, but that's just because that's what the treatment was developed for. The strategies can really be used with all kinds of behaviors, like I mentioned, and the strategies are really concrete. They're really tangible. They're really simple to implement, and they have a lot of acronyms to help you remember um, how to use these different strategies in your conversations. I really like to think of motivational interviewing as just a way of collaborating and having a change conversation with someone. It doesn't necessarily have to be a type of therapy. It really is useful for anyone. So the theory of motivational interviewing is really that it's centered on a client-centered and directive approach that focuses on someone's intrinsic motivation to change while addressing maybe some ambivalence or maybe they're not fully sure they kind of have one foot in one foot out about the changes they want to make. It uses an empathetic style of interactions. Um, which means being able to accept what someone is saying, even if you feel like their behaviors might be harmful or might be hurting someone. And it really emphasizes that just because you're being accepting and empathetic towards someone doesn't mean that you agree with or condone their behavior. It just means that you're there to listen, to understand and practice that acceptance with the idea that they want to change or you wanna help them change that behavior. So it doesn't have to mean that you're saying everything they're doing is okay. Another part of the theory is that it's directive. So even though you're actively showing that acceptance to someone, you're still also subtly sort of helping them make steps towards whatever change they're saying they want to make or you've noticed would be helpful for them. And this is done by encouraging them to talk about change, helping ask questions and facilitate conversation that makes them think about different things that they can change or ways to improve. And I'll talk a bit more about specific ways that you can kind of work on eliciting change for people. And then another part of the theory is that it's focused on enhancing intrinsic motivation. So the goal is to increase the person's internal motivation for change, meaning that they make that internal decision for themselves that they want to make a change or do something differently in their life. They're not doing it for anyone else. They've decided that this is going to benefit them. Of course, that might also mean it benefits other people or their loved ones, but predominantly has to come from within that this is something they want to do. Enhancing the motivation for change also means helping them to build confidence that they are capable of reaching their goals or setting a plan for their life or whatever change they want to see in their life. Then 
you know, if the goal seems unattainable for someone at the outset, it's going to be difficult for them to find that intrinsic motivation. So you want to help them by asking important questions to help them increase that motivation, which then makes it more achievable, more attainable for them to start making changes in the behavior. Motivational interviewing is also about exploring and resolving ambivalence. So kind of thinking of that as maybe having one foot in, one foot out. It's like they see the benefits of change. Maybe they see how it could be helpful to go to college or quit smoking or start exercising or start cooking for their family. Whatever the change may be, they see how it can be helpful. There's also part of them that also sees the benefit of the way their life that the way their life currently is. Maybe it's really hard to change. We all know it's really hard to change or set goals or make a plan. And so this kind of creates this sort of push and pull. And so part of motivational interviewing is starting to increase that motivation by exploring and resolving these sort of feelings of that back and forth. And you can do that by reflection, by empathizing with them and various other techniques that I'll talk about through the rest of the presentation. So the overall sort of spirit of motivational interviewing or the foundation that it's built on can be outlined using the acronym PACE. So that's partnership, acceptance, evocation, and compassion. And you see there's some examples here of what that means. So partnership is reassuring someone that's coming to you saying like, hey, I really want to work on this, or even if they're just sharing with you something that's going on, emphasizing that you're working with them together, you're collaborating, you're not making decisions for them emphasizing that you're happy that they've come to you, you're excited to be able to be part of this journey with them, and you're accepting them where they are as you work on these things together. It's also saying you're going to create a space for them to share, a space for them to feel safe and know that they're not being judged. And it's saying that you want to understand and respect what's going on with them and not put your own judgments or experiences unless they want those. And so you can kind of think of this as autonomy over authority. It's letting them make their own decisions, respecting their decisions, respecting their boundaries, rather than trying to impress certain changes or strategies upon them. And it's about collaborating instead of confronting them. It's not making them feel attacked. It's not telling them they have to do this or there's one way to do something. It's really being there to listen and partner with them as they're making change. And it's about evocation rather than education. You know, people don't always want to hear your advice, and sometimes that doesn't really help them when they're coming to you with a problem or something they're trying to change. So it's about helping them find that change and take action within themselves rather than teaching them or sort of preaching at them. So the principles behind motivational interviewing are helping someone to see the discrepancy maybe between what they want to happen in their life and what they're actually doing. So when they're saying, you know, they really want to work on better communication with their spouse, but they're always yelling or always fighting or always irritable, helping them see that that doesn't match with the change they're saying they want to make. It's also being consistently empathetic and making sure that they're being seen, they're being hard, and that you are listening to them. It's understanding that change doesn't always happen just because we want it to happen. There's a lot of complex things that can get in the way. Maybe you don't have time. Maybe you're tired. Maybe the kids are always yelling or the house is always dirty. There's so many things that can make it difficult to fully commit and make that decision. And so it's keeping in mind all of those things. And it's also emphasizing that the person has the right to make their own decisions and to decide this process. And you also have the right to not engage with them if, you know, it's something that isn't really working or it's draining you. So self-efficacy on your part, if you're trying to help someone make some changes and maybe you just need to step back because it's too draining and self-efficacy self on their part in terms of letting them make their decisions and find this process and journey along the way. So the four processes or things that you're really doing through these different strategies and motivational interviewing are collaborating and forming a partnership and a relationship with that person that's really going to be based on trust. It's going to be based on focusing, what's focusing on what's most important for that person and making sure that you're helping them take actions and ask questions that really focus on their goals, their values, what they find to be what really drives them in life or what's driving the change. 
It's also evoking interest and motivation for change, finding out why they want to make this decision. Why do they want to go back to school? Why do they want to quit their job? Why do they want to work out? Finding out what makes that really important and necessary for them. And then lastly, it's going to be about planning for that process of change. What are they going to do? How are they going to establish goals? Is there something that you can help them with? Is it just being supportive? Is it giving them strategies or techniques that you learned about how to set goals? And what does that plan for change really look like? So something that's really important to keep in mind are that people go through different stages of change. So in the pre-contemplation stage, that's when people probably aren't considering change yet. They might be doing some things that you don't agree with, or maybe that are even hurting their family or causing conflict. This might be where they don't really see that they're doing anything that's hurting anyone or causing any problems. So they might not see their behavior as a problem. And so it's important to just you know, meet them where they're at there and trying to start a conflict or stage an intervention really isn't going to help someone move along to the next stage, which is the contemplation stage. And that's where there might be starting to become more aware of what's going on with them, more aware of maybe some problems in their health. Maybe they just had a doctor visit and the doctor is saying like, you know, you really need to get your blood pressure under control or your cholesterol under, cholesterol under control. Um, or else you're going to have to be on medication or, you know, whatever the outcome is, they're kind of starting to see that something's not really right and they might need to make some sort of change now. Then when we sort of move into that preparation stage, they might start making some small changes or maybe start doing some research. Maybe they're getting a second opinion or maybe they get a gym membership. They haven't quite started yet, but they're just looking at their options, trying to figure things out, maybe doing some reading, talking to other people and kind of getting in a an information gathering stage about how they can effectively implement whatever change they're working towards. Then in their fourth step, that's when they're really starting to actually make those changes. They're engaging in actions. They're starting to go on walks. They're using pauses or timeouts when they notice that they're getting into an argument with their sister or their brother or their spouse. They're stepping away or maybe making sure they're getting better sleep, different things like that. They're really showing that they're trying to work on implementing what they decided this change was going to be. And then the maintenance stage is when they're really, they've been successful in implementing the changes, they've been successful in taking the actions. And so they're trying to just find ways to keep it up and keep doing what they were doing and just find ways to maintain that behavior and avoid any sort of temptations or anything that might throw them off of what they're working towards. But it's also important to remember that sometimes people have a lot. So even if, let's say, you've gone a month without arguing with your spouse, you all are doing great, your relationship's the best it's ever been, and then you get into a huge argument because one day you're just really frustrated and irritable. The important thing is this whole stages of change can just continue, and you don't necessarily have to go around in a circular manner like it's shown on the screen. It's just about recognizing where you can start again and jump back in. So an important way to help someone talk about making change can be thought of using the acronym FORCE. And that's when you're able to ask open-ended questions, which are not yes or no questions. It's usually something that's what or who or why or when, something that requires more thought and more explanation. It's using affirmations, which are statements that are recognizing someone's strength, recognizing what they're good at, and really trying to build them up as you're talking to them. And then the next thing is reflecting, helping them know that you're listening, you're really trying to understand, you're not just a body that's there, you're actually engaged in the conversation and engaged in the process with them. And then summarizing, that's reflecting to them what you've heard and maybe taking it at a deeper level saying, you know, so it sounds like this is what you want, or I'm hearing that this is what's important to you and really letting them correct you if something's wrong or you're not understanding them and being open to that correction. So DARNCAT is another acronym that is used in motivational interviewing, and it's used to determine really where someone is at with how much they want to change or feel capable of changing in the moment. So the D is desire. That's asking them questions that get them to talk about what they want to do. A is the ability, asking them questions, get them to think about what they can reasonably do. 
and then thinking about their reasons, asking them why it's important to them, finding out what their values are. And then their needs. Is this something they actually really need to do or it's going to be harmful or damage their life or their relationship in ways that are going to be difficult to repair? Those are kind of the pre-stages of talking about change, really thinking about why this is going to be important for them. The next part, the cat part, is when you're starting to think about the actual planning stages and sort of moving more into that preparation and action phase, what can they do right now? What are they willing to commit to doing? And then the actuation, what are they ready to start doing? Maybe they can do something or they're thinking about it, but they need to get some more things in place before they can actually implement it. And then last is asking them questions about taking steps. It's kind of that uh, the accountability piece. What did they do following up with them? You know, if you've got a friend that saying they wanted to quit smoking, you engaged in a conversation with them about it maybe reach back out to them in a week and say, hey, you know, I know we talked about these different steps. How have you been doing with that? How's it going? And being ready to be accepting and empathetic with whatever their response is. So this is just a list of different strategies you can use to help initiate change talk and help someone get someone talking about change. It doesn't have to be a really in-depth or long conversation even. And that's one of the really cool things about motivational interviewing that makes it so tangible and applicable to so many different conversations and arenas in our lives is it's really small things that we can do or really tiny changes to the way that we ask questions that can make a really big difference for people. So I'll go through quickly what these different strategies are and how to use them. So the readiness ruler, you don't literally have to have this sheet out with you, but it's asking the question, you know, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how important do you really think that is to you right now? If they say, I don't know, maybe like a three, you can ask, but it's kind of low. Why isn't it a nine or why isn't it a five or a six? And it just gets a conversation going about maybe why it's not so important to them. The other side of that is how confident are they about making the change and asking them that same that same question and following up with them about why they feel more or less confident about whatever change they're trying to implement. The other technique is called querying extremes. And so this is, again, just another way to ask questions. You know, if someone comes up to you and says, I'm really thinking about quitting my job, I've been really tired, I'm always frustrated when I get home and it's just not working well for me and my family. You can ask, what concerns you most about quitting your job? And if you stayed at your job, what do you think the worst thing is that'll happen? On the opposite side of that, you can ask, if you decide that you want to change your job, what's the best thing you can imagine happening for you and your family? And if quitting your job goes well or finding a different job goes well, what good changes might happen out of that? It's getting them to think about sort of both the best and the worst outcomes. So it kind of even prepares them for what might happen because most likely those things probably won't happen. It's possible, but usually the extremes don't typically happen. And so you can kind of prepare for the whole spectrum of what may possibly happen if you start to make these changes. Something else that's really helpful is just exploring values. And this is really related to maybe asking the question about what's important to them. This is just a list of different, a list of different values that someone might have that you can kind of talk with them about or see if you notice them mention any of these things in your conversation with them. And then maybe call it out a little bit to them and say, oh, it sounds like having fun is really important to you. Do you think that what you're doing right now is fun in your life? Or, oh, it seems like loyalty is really, really big for you and your family. What ways are you showing loyalty? And does this decision align with that? Very simple questions that you can use to have a conversation with someone about what's important to them and what really drives their lives. This is just some examples of how you can continue change talk. You can ask for more details. This one's specific to smoking, but again, you can use it to, for any example that you want. So what ways will you feel better after you quit smoking, after you go to the gym, after you go back to school? or listening to what they're saying. And it sounds like you're really starting to consider making this change for good. How does that feel? And then affirming them with either body language, whether that's just nodding or actually telling them like, oh, I see that that's a really good point. Or, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I can see why you wanna make this change or 
oh, that makes a lot of sense. I can see why it's been hard for you to make this change. You can use it in both regards. Another part of motivational interviewing is rolling with resistance, which simply means when someone gets to a point where maybe they're having doubts or they don't realize that something they're doing is hurting you or someone you love or someone they love, it's meeting them where they are. It's not trying to engage in a power struggle or engage in a fight with them about why what they're doing is wrong. It's just gently pointing out to them like, oh, it sounds like you really, really value your family, but it sounds like you've all been arguing a lot lately. What do you think is going on there? It's not judging them. It's not blaming them for what's going on. It's just being curious about what's happening. And when they respond to you, making sure that you're listening and making sure that you're reflecting to them what you heard so they can correct you and keep that conversation going. This is a specific kind of reflection example. So an amplified reflection is a way of reflecting to someone what you heard that sort of exaggerates a certain part. That way you're not accusing them of anything or judging them for anything. You're actually sort of prompting them to make corrections to what they said or what they thought. So in this example, I don't know why my family keeps pushing me to get help. I hardly ever drink. And if you respond, by saying like, yeah, it doesn't seem like your family has anything to worry about because I don't notice you drinking. They might say, well, I do drink a little bit and sometimes I make pretty bad choices afterwards. You didn't judge them. You actually kind of agreed with them in a way, but it got them to notice something that didn't quite line up with what they said. And they initiated something about changing without you having to even ask questions. Reframing is another way it's sort of like a reflection. If someone says something to you like, oh, my parents are trying to get rid of me. That's the only reason they're trying to send me to college. You can say something like, it sounds like they're doing the best they can, but maybe they made some mistakes in how they're communicating that to you. And maybe they don't know that their idea of trying to help you is actually hurting you. It's showing the person that you're seeing their side and also showing them that you're seeing the other person's side as well and maybe helping them build some of that perspective. Another kind of reflection is this double-sided reflection. Um, again, this is a substance use example, but can be used broadly as well. Saying, I don't wanna quit drinking, it's just isn't a problem for me. And someone responding with, you don't feel like drinking is a big enough problem for you to worry about, except for those times like you shared last week when you get really angry at your family. So if we take this example of someone who maybe went to a doctor, the doctor said their cholesterol is really high and they need to start cutting out something of their diet. And they say, I don't really feel like I eat that badly. Like most of the time, my doctor visits are just fine. And you can say something like, sounds like you don't really think that how you're eating is making bad choices is or is causing problems for you. The last time we talked, you said that the doctor results were pretty clear that something was going on. It's not judging them. It's just kind of showing how what they're saying and some other things that they said don't exactly line up and opening the door for them to explain that to you. Something else that's really important is helping the person build confidence that they can make change. That's done by asking open-ended questions about change, like some of the examples that I showed. It's also done by identifying their own strengths and reflecting that to them, sharing with them what you see them being good at or what the positive things are about them. And also discussing past successes, reminding them of times when they've successfully made a change or successfully taken a step towards their change. So these are just some examples of ways, more examples of ways that you can ask them when open-ended questions to give them the space to share with you what they feel comfortable sharing. And I think something important to remember about asking open-ended questions is also that you're not pushing, right? If someone doesn't wanna answer a question or they're feeling uncomfortable, part of motivational interviewing is meeting them where they are and saying, you know, oh, it sounds like you didn't really like that question or, oh, I might've upset you, I'm really sorry about that. Maybe we can talk about this at a different time. Or maybe I can talk to you about this in a different way. Why don't you let me know what could I do to talk to you about this in a better way? And really being open to what they have to say about that. This is just a list of different positive traits or strengths that people may have that can be really helpful to keep in mind to share with people and let the people, even if you're not talking about change, just let the people that you love in your life know the good things about them and help lift them up. 
you know, saying, you're always really grateful. I wish I could have that much gratitude in my life. Or you're always really selfless and taking care of everyone. Or you're so generous with what you do for your family or for the church or the community. And some of these might not sound like strengths, but for some people, this can be really important. You know, saying they're really practical. I can always count on you to have a really logical, thought out idea or something that makes sense. Or saying, you know, you, wow, you're really frugal. You got your budget in order. You're really good at handling your money. Can you help me with mine? And really showing interest in their strengths and what they're good at. And discussing past successes is just reiterating to them the times that they've done things right. It's so easy to focus on the negative or focus on trying to correct someone, especially someone who might be doing something that's hurting you or your family. And so I think it's really important to be able to mention times when they've done something successfully. So after you've kind of had some conversations with someone about change or try to broad, bring up conversations to someone about something they're doing that needs to be changed. And they're on board, they're really ready to commit to the change. You've asked all the questions, you've had all the conversations. This is, these are three sort of simple steps that you can do to start implementing and building a plan of how you can really focus on making change and taking those steps that someone really wants to take. And so part of that is setting SMART goals. SMART goals, again, even outside of the context of motivational interviewing can be used for anything really in your life that you want to change or you want to adjust. And so SMART goals are goals that are specific. What exactly is it that you're trying to change or you want to do? They're measurable. How will you know when you met this goal? They're achievable. Is it in your power to accomplish this goal? Is it something you actually can do? Is it realistic? Do you have the resources you need? Is it realistic in terms of money, time, geography, whatever it is, is it something you can reasonably achieve? And lastly, timely, when do you want to accomplish it? And I think it's also important to have some flexibility in your time because you can also get discouraged if you don't meet a goal by a certain time frame. So maybe have a few different iterations of what would need to happen for it to happen by a certain time point. And one of the things I really love about motivational interviewing is all the acronyms. It makes it so easy to remember how to use all of these different strategies and how to use all of these different steps. And remembering that it's about a conversation. It's about learning how to better communicate with your loved ones and the people that mean the most to us to maintain that connection, make sure they're not feeling judged, make sure that they're not feeling hurt by you and really be open and willing to just make some minor tweaks in the way that we talk to each other that's going to be more understanding and more empathetic. And I think one last thing to emphasize is knowing the line as well. If someone is doing something you know that's causing pain or causing hurt and you've tried to have the conversations and you've tried to do everything that you can do, knowing what to do to keep yourself and your heart safe and protect yourself and your family and your needs as well. And it can be a tricky balance but it's definitely something to always keep in mind is how to help someone else and also take care of yourself in that process. And that's all I have for motivational interviewing, but I really appreciate everyone's time. Excellent. This was so useful. Thank you so much for your time today especially because May is mental health awareness or mental wellness awareness month. Mm -hmm. And you gave a lot of great resources. So tell me out of all of the tips and the resources that you gave as a lay person, right? A non-mental health professional, mm -hmm. whether it's a parent to a child or a partner to partner, or even just an accountability or just a friend or even a colleague, what, tool or what skill would you find to be the most useful um, one that can be implemented in any situation during any time frame? I think the one that I always come back to is the idea of using ORs, which is one of the acronyms. So asking someone open-ended questions in your conversations, making sure you're affirming them, making sure they feel heard, they know you're listening, and making sure you're taking time to pause and reflect and tell them what you heard. You can do that in all of your conversations with your employer, your kids, your boyfriend, spouse, whoever it is. It really helps, I think, create a natural and 
accepting and really just like wholesome and safe conversation for whatever it is you need to talk to them about. It could even be great things in their life. You can ask them open-ended questions and sit there and praise and celebrate them for that. Excellent. Thank you so much. I was secretly hoping that you would say that skill because <laughs> yes, that is one that is phenomenal, especially for individuals who may be having trouble connecting with their emotions or being open to their mm -hmm. child, their family, or even their partner about different things. That technique really does uh, help open up the dialogue. And so Again, thank you so much. And um, for all of you who may have missed this, you can go to the website to get more resources. And we just hope that each one of you have an awesome day.